Hey, beautiful people, I'm Yolanda Johnson Bryant, and this is The Other Side of the Dash. Welcome back, beautiful people. If you are new here, please take a moment to either subscribe or hit the follow if you're watching on the on the YouTube channel or hit the follow button on any podcast that you may be listening to. Today's guest is Dr. Deborah Anderson, and we're going to have an interesting conversation uh, about being an adult caregiver. So welcome to today's show, Dr. Deborah Anderson. Deborah, how are you? Thank you. Thank you, fine, and thank you for having me. You're welcome. Deborah is so modest, uh, but Deborah uh, has a PhD, and we're going to talk about her accolades in a minute. But she's very modest, and I'm like, you earned that doctorate. You better, <laughs> doctor, Doctor Anderson. <laughs> so, Deborah, you have a okay again the, the doctorate, which is in higher education um, and leadership, a master's in higher education administration, a bachelor's in Italian studies a bachelor's in journalism. Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's interesting that you have a bachelor's in, in, in Italian. Tell me a sentence in Italian. Not that I don't understand what you're saying, but give me a sentence in Italian. Oh, you would put me on the spot. <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. Buon, buongiorno, come okay. stai? Okay. okay, okay. Sto bene, grazie. <laughs> oh, see, look at you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> And I found it interesting, uh, Deborah, Dr. Dev, that you uh, taught in North Carolina. And I found that ironic because my husband and I just moved from North Carolina. We lived in Greensboro and you uh, were on staff there at UNCG and also as well as Chapel Hill. What year were you in uh, North Carolina? We moved to Virginia in 2001 and we spent five years in Southern Virginia. And so I actually uh, did a commute to uh, Greensboro and to the Chapel Hill area. And while I was at UNCG, I was in the School of Education and um, worked for a center for educational studies. And that meant a connection with the uh, external community within Greensboro in this within the School of Education and offering programs to the community. Okay, so we were, I'm actually originally from Denver, Colorado, but um, mm -hmm. I lived here when my husband flew here, in te I'm in North Texas, flew here and dragged me back to North Carolina and married me. So I was there from 2007 <laughs> to 2020 and I moved back here to North Texas. So yeah, I just found that pretty ironic. Now, I wanna ask you, people usually who wanna get in the field of education have this yearning early on. At what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to be an educator? And what made you decide to be, that it would be in the higher levels of education? Okay, so I knew pretty early on. Um, I graduated from high school in 1981. I spent maybe a year or two kind of floundering around, not really knowing what my path would be, and ended up um, being hired as a secretary for a marketing division within the Kansas uh, Board of Agriculture. So I was doing secretarial work for promoters of Kansas uh, grains and meat products and so on. And really loved the marketing aspect of it and decided a year later that I would um, go ahead and transition to a four-year institution away from home. Okay. And so that led me to the University of Kansas. And it just so happened that I ended up getting a full-time job for university relations, which is the marketing branch for the institution. And within that, you're able to see all of the inner workings of how higher education works um, by working with the PR aspect of it, marketing, printing, uh, news media, and so on. And so from there, I knew that I was interested in working on a degree in journalism. 
And so that was my initial start. Okay. So now with all the accolades, all the education and so on, are you still currently in the higher education field? Yes. Yes. I found it to be uh, my calling, if you will. Um, I really love the administrative part of it. So higher ed administration is really all about um, creating that student experience from enrollment management aspects. How do you enroll for your classes? How are you doing in your classes? Um, the disciplinary aspect, you know, students bring in all of their life experiences with them. Sometimes that prevents them from being as um, successful as they might be. So I've had all areas um, in terms of um, working with the course management, working with the student success side, et cetera. And so I have had the opportunity to work in four-year institutions and two-year which, you know, the climate is a little bit different. It's more of a non-residential, students are busy, they're non-traditional typically. And so um, I've worked with that population for 15 years. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna ask you two questions. I'm gonna ask you one, what has been the biggest challenge? And then two, what 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 has been the biggest joy in this journey? The biggest journey, the biggest, okay, I'm sorry, what was the first question? Uh, the the biggest challenge and then the biggest joy. Okay, so I think the the biggest challenge is higher ed tends to operate at a very slow pace, and sometimes um, just within any business or industry, there can be a political landscape, and that really isn't my forte. I just am not really good with the politics. I just want to get the work done, basically. So that's probably the biggest challenge. The joy, I think, has been my ability to create opportunity where there really maybe isn't one, or being able to connect the dots so that we can see a higher vision on what's possible. And I've always had a love for technology. So along my journey within higher ed, I've had the opportunity to present ideas to create opportunity to advance technology. And so I've tried to utilize that as a strength and it's really a joy because I love technology and efficiencies within higher education. Right. Okay. I see. Now you have also a degree in journalism. So I'm going to mm-hmm. ask you, has that be, proved to be any proved to be of any benefit in what you've done in the last few years? Yes. Now I do feel the the foundation for journalism isn't so much for me um, having a writing career, but being a strong writer and being able to present yourself and articulate your ideas in a succinct, efficient um, way so that you can present information the way that you you want it best presented. And so in that respect, it's been really good. And I think it's been also very helpful to uh, have an understanding of how communication works, the different styles of communication, I'm typically not the one who wants to be in front of the camera. I'm typically the one that wants to be behind the scenes, coordinating it and making it um, come across successful, but flawless. That's what my goal is. And so my degree in journalism, my track was public relations. And so I've always found that to be of benefit, especially when you're creating events, you know, working with people, um, fundraising, any anything that you typically would do, there's a journalism um, aspect to it. Okay, and that's what we have in common. I am an introvert. I'm not sure if you are, but usually introverted people like to be in the background and not the forefront, yes. and that's how I am. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in a minute, we're going to talk about you being an adult um, caregiver, but Let's talk a little bit about, we know that you're on the other side of your dash Mm -hmm. and what is retirement looking like for for Dr. Anderson? You know, I'm really not quite sure. I'm not quite there yet. And it seems like my identity has shifted in that um, 
you know, given our personal situation and my husband is in memory care, I'm in essence charting a new path. And so I'm really not quite ready to nestle into my retirement chair. So I'm thinking that maybe the shift could be my interest, all of the things that I have been interested in, maybe it's time to focus on those as opposed to just having that traditional retirement um, role where you, you know, you retire from your job and then you relax. (laughs) Yeah, you relax. I don't know. I kind of want to explore Uh, different opportunities that I haven't had a chance to focus on yet. Okay. And we're going to talk about a couple of those in a minute, but let's go ahead and get Mm -hmm. deep into this conversation. So Dr. Anderson is a caregiver for her husband who has Alzheimer's. So Dr. Anderson, tell us one, how long has he had it? How did this come about? And what was the process? I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of change in your life. You had to adjust certain things. So tell us yes. what that looked like for you. It's been, it's been uh, pretty quick. Um, my husband was diagnosed with early, um, younger onset Alzheimer's um, in 20, 2018, but actually the journey really started a year before that. Um, he was laid off from his position. He was in arbitration Uh, in HR for manufacturing company and experienced a huge layoff with 300 others. So he was flying all over the country doing interviews. And a little bit later on in the year, later in 2016, I noticed that he, uh, his recall wasn't as good. And that's just, that's not my husband. So I knew that something wasn't quite right. Um, He thought I was a little bit extra by asking him to go to the doctor, but he went. And I really credit our general physician um, for referring him to a neuropsychologist for a cognitive evaluation. That uh, neuropsychologist uh, said that he probably wouldn't be doing the same level of work that he had always done. And so from there, you know, I said, hey, don't worry about it. You know, you've worked a long 30 year career. Let's not worry about it. Maybe you can do other types of work. Right. Well, it just seemed to happen so fast. And so we ended up having a a lumbar puncture with a neurologist and he did have the Alzheimer's uh, tau protein in his spinal fluid. So the other thing I might say is my husband played college football. He broke his neck playing college football, and we met um, at age 15 and dated in high school. So the minute I learned he broke his neck, we were together. He still had his halo on, you know, the big halo with the screws. Right. And, you know, he recovered from that, but I do believe that, like, the the clock started ticking at that point. Right. And so um, for him, his advancement in terms of the disease, his decline really happened pretty quickly. And I would say within the last two years, because he was driving in 2020, he was able to fully communicate in 2020. But by the end of the year, he no longer had awareness of where he lived, birth dates, anniversary dates, names, things like that. And at this point in 2022, he is in memory care and has been there for five months. But mid year last year, it just became too much. And so, as trying to work full time and manage someone with uh, the diagnosis is pretty difficult. And they do say that caregivers uh, usually end up passing or having um, stress related um, illnesses because of the caregiver stress, it's just too much. And so we had to make a decision or I did on how to help the both both of us. So that's, okay. So that led me to moving out of state, uh, relocating in North uh, Texas. And we have a large friend uh, and family base here. He has uh, college teammates who come and visit him weekly. They are like brothers to me. And so they, we really, we have a a circle around us 
to help okay. us navigate this. Okay. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to ask you about how you are doing mentally and physically, but I just want to kind of, I'm glad that you talked about how he had the injury in, in football, in college. And yes. a lot of times people will ask, and I don't mean to sound ignorant. Well, you know, mm -hmm. do they know what caused it? And I know sometimes it's not necessarily what causes it. It could be a trade. It could be something else. But I'm glad that you kind of clarified that because it would seem, although I'm sure they're not 100%, that mm -hmm. would have been the beginning of what we have now. Um, I won't even pretend that I know what you're going through, but I remember when I lived in Arizona for a short time, I had an aunt, her name was Noni, and she developed Alzheimer's. And my ex-husband and I at that time, my husband at the time, would uh, watch her mm -hmm. and during the daytime while my godmother went to work. And it was just so odd. It was, it was, it was okay at first. She would sit in her, she had this chair in my living room that she would just sit in. And then one day my husband came home from work and he was laying in the bed. So I went in and got in the bed and laid with him. And from the angle the, the door was, she could see inside. Oh my God. She got upset. She ran in. This woman was, she, she was big. She pulled me out the bed and she was like, I forget the name of her husband that mm -hmm. was before she, he had passed away and I forget his name, but she called my husband by his name and she would not let me even go near. If I tried to go to the bathroom, which was by the bedroom, she would have a fit. So she was thinking that my husband was her husband mm. and she didn't know who we were anymore. And that was just a scary, scary feeling. And my, my, my husband, now, his father died of Alzheimer's, and it's just a scary feeling. So I have to wonder, all the stuff that you're going through, that you've been through, and, you know, your thoughts of what the future looks like, how is your mental health and your physical health? Well, I've struggled a little bit, but um, we have two sons, and they've been just uh, very encouraging um, for me to make sure that, you know, I seek the support that I need. So I do have a therapist I meet with weekly. In fact, my next session is this afternoon at four every week. And I do have a life coach who has helped me uh, set goals, uh, even in preparing, it, preparing for this move. Because, you know, moving from another state, packing up your home, um, trying to identify the appropriate facility for my husband. Um, uh, with the understanding that he is the kid in memory care. There is at least a 15 to 20 year age difference between my husband and most people, you know, the other residents, just different. So making sure that I found something that I felt comfortable with, uh, which allows me to still contribute to his care, but not have the ongoing stress. Um, I try to exercise. But um, what I haven't mentioned is we lost both of our mothers within the last month and a half. Mm. Um, my mother passed the uh, day after Thanksgiving. His mother passed three days later. Mm. We grew up in the same town. Our mothers were at the same funeral chapel. Um, mm. I'm envisioning them resting side by side. Wow. And so we've had a lot. I mean, not that he's aware of any of this. I did not mention it to him, wow. don't know that he would cognitively understand anyway, and there's no benefit in telling right. him. Right. But for me personally, there's been a lot of weight on me in addition to um, accepting the fact that my partner, my life partner is no longer himself. He is physically there, he's physically fit. And if you saw him, you'd never think that there was anything wrong with him but cognitively he is no longer there. So there's a, a whole acceptance process of that, trying to work through the acceptance of where I am in my life right now, which is, uh, it's hit me kind of hard because I am alone. I mean, right. I'm not alone, but right. I am kind of alone. Right. And two of the, the two uh, most closest people to me are no longer there, if that right. makes sense. Right, and does. so I am leaning hard on making sure that I, um, I understand what I'm feeling and coping with. 
And when the wave hits me, I accept it and I go, I go with, with it. it. So, so I just I apologize. If I, you know, if I'm emotional, I just, I just apologize and keep it moving. Right, but I think right. we as black women have to be um, open to accepting help and realizing when we need that support because stress is a silent killer. And once you reach the age 50, um, there just are a lot of uh, variables that surround us. You know, people we know that we went to school with aren't, you know, with us anymore. Right. Or we become caregivers to our parents or our spouses right. or, you know, whatever life throws our way, we have to be aware that there are supports out there available to us and take advantage of those and realize that we're not alone. I think I'm that's glad, the key. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because we as black women do, we're, we're, we're looked upon as these super women. And so we don't want to let anybody down. So we try to fill in that role all the while, while we're taking care of everybody else, we're dying inside. And yes. I am a true testament that stress is a killer because that has been the cause of all of my health issues, stroke, uh, yes. diabetes, heart attack. My doctor did not expect me to live past age 30. So, and I'm still here by the grace of God, but I'm still learning after I turn 50, maybe right before I turn 50, I started saying to myself, okay, I can't do this. This is killing me. Um, mm -hmm. And then I was given the task from God to take care of my granddaughter. So here I am after having an empty nest, taking care of another child in my fifties. And mm. so uh, that has been stressful, but I'm glad that you, you, you expressed that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to reach out, use the, the resources and um, don't kill yourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's already hard on you, Dr. Anderson. I know it's hard on you. Um, but it is important to reach out, uh, get you a village, look into some resources, which is going to bring me to my next point. You and I were talking, and I believe you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that for this particular issue, situation, there's not a whole lot of resources to help you, maybe in the financial aspect. Can you kind of elaborate on that, what you meant by that? Well, okay, so I... This is just my opinion, but I feel that um, our health system and our federal support system um, really is designed for those who have no means at all. If right. you have any means at all, it's very difficult, especially for a diagnosis like Alzheimer's. Um, for us, luckily, my husband was has always been a rainy day saver type of guy. Um, we're debt free. I mean, in terms of not having a lot of consumer debt. Right. And I learned that skill from him. And I think that that's something that, especially in the last um, six months, because I'm actually staying with a childhood friend until I find a home, you know, I'm in transition, living out of two suitcases. Our home is packed up in another state. And, and you're, so, moving, you're moving in North Texas, you know this real estate market is a beast. <laughs> it's crazy. Please pray for me. I am. <laughs> it's a beast. It's a beast. And so that's, we can talk about that offline too. But, <laughs> but uh, I, my point that I was about to make is that our house is packed up and it's been packed up for five months. And I really, aside from needing my hair product, <laughs> and maybe a few other things. I really have not missed those things. And so we get caught up in things. Right. And this has taught me I don't need a lot of things. But in terms of the support that's available to an Alzheimer's family, you're really kind of on your own to figure that out. And what I've learned is that, yes, there are resources out there, but you, it's up to you to try and figure out how to put the, connect the dots together. Right, exactly. And in terms of the financial piece of it, unless you really have no means at all, it's very difficult. And, and so um, what can you do? Well, in our case, we're utilizing social security disability and we're utilizing retirement. And I'm trying to maximize that as best I can and project and pray that 
you know, something will work out. I mean, I don't really know beyond eight years and I have no idea what my husband's life trajectory is. Right. You just have to pray on that and go with it. But I think I've learned that excess really isn't necessary. I don't, I really don't need anything. Sure. And that's a good thing. I mean, right. I feel good about that and that's a blessing. Um, but the financial piece is very difficult. I think if it's, um, you know, for Alzheimer's, usually the individual requires some sort of 24 hour care. Whereas you have other illnesses, um, there are needs there, but, you know, there's no wandering and right. all of those things. I right. mean, he needs to be safe and it's easier for me to pay for a facility to manage that as opposed to having someone in my home and paying someone a wage, which really would probably double the amount that, that it would be in a facility. Right. If I if money were no object, he'd be at home with me. Right. But right. I got you. So how often do you visit him and then does he still recognize you? He does recognize me. He does not have the ability to communicate verbally. Everything okay. that he says is gibberish. Okay. And so that's a unique aspect, I think, of because every case is different, but early onset is way more aggressive. And where a lot of the typical um, aspects of Alzheimer's might be repeating the same questions or, you know, um, thinking that mistaking, like you mentioned for your, was it your right. aunt? Right. right. Um, and those, we didn't have any of that. My husband was able to speak one year and then within six months, he, he just isn't able to speak. Right. He knows who I am. He trusts me. I think that that's just ingrained. He, he isn't able to say, hey, Deb, where have you been? There's no sense of the last time, like I could be gone a week and, you know, I don't get any sense that he knows that it's been a week, um, okay. but he does trust me and there is a bond and a connection that oh. we still have. Okay, that's great. That's good, that's good to hear. And, yeah. you know, God's plan is God's plan. I will be praying for mm -hmm. you and your family that he gets better or, and, and that you have, you know, no stress on you, but you know, God's plan is his plan, but yeah. either way, I will still be praying for you. Thank now, you. You're welcome. Now we mentioned uh, that you wanted to dive into a couple of things. Uh, one pertaining to um, the Alzheimer's journey and then mm -hmm. another one so unfortunately you lost your mother and your mother-in-law, but yes. God blessed you with a new life of a grandchild. So you yes. were also talking about doing a project as far as that goes. Tell us about these book projects that you want to endeavor. Well, okay. So I have two, two adult sons. Uh, they're eight years apart. So my oldest son is 34. The younger one is 26. And I've always, I've always had the um, at the um, inclination to write a children's book series, and I've carried uh, ideas around since the really the younger one was two. I just didn't didn't get to it. Okay. Life gets in the way. I I've been carrying these ideas around. I have this beautiful, sweet grandson. I have to get these. I have to get these ideas published, and so I did join the. Um, Society of Children's Writers, and there's a North Texas chapter. Mm -hmm. So I joined um, for inspiration. And my goal is to publish at some point, or at least seek publish, publishing opportunities. Um, and that may be one of those retirement um, opportunities that I had mentioned before. And so um, I do have like a set of ideas that I'd like to bring to life and uh, hope to start pursuing that um, re relatively soon. Okay. Oh, and my, my baby grandson was born on my mother's birthday. Oh, oh Yeah, so sweet. I thought that was pretty special. He was a week overdue. Uh, her birthday was, is de was December 1st, and so he was born on her birthday. So we thought that was pretty special. That was very special. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to let you know that I'm an author. I've written several books. I have, I plan on having a couple 
coming out by the end of the year. We'll see, because look, I need to slow down. <laughs> but I'm just going to tell you, if you find that you're at your wit's end, because what I find when I talk to a lot of uh, first-time authors is that I can't find an agent. I can't find a publisher. Look, Homegirl here created her own publishing company and published her own stuff. So if that ever gets in the back of your mind, if you ever get to that point, just go ahead and yes. do it yourself. If you have any questions, you know, you just send me an email. Hey, what, what about this? So you also want to write about Alzheimer's. So what is that? Is that is that going to be like a a memoir? Is that going to be a self help? Is that going to be an instruct? How is that that going to look once you? Because I'm claiming it. I'm claiming it. You're going to mm -hmm. get it done. So yeah. how is that going to look like? I see it as twofold because um, I mentioned that my husband is pretty much the kid of memory care, <laughs> and there really is no fit for him. Um, he his needs are vastly different than the traditional residents. So when his teammates go over to visit him, they're throwing the football around. They're playing one-on-one, <laughs> -on -one, you know, his friends are coming and they're playing badminton. They're doing all of these very active activities. And I just don't think the world has created a space for the early younger onset right. uh, Alzheimer resident. And I think there's an opportunity there for memory care to reach an underserved population. And that, that hasn't happened yet. I wanna become involved in creating awareness for that. I am on um, a group, a Facebook group with wives who are in the jo similar journeys. Um, all of our husbands have early onset Alzheimer's. There's over 900, wives wow. in this group and the founder of the group is in texas and so i'm hoping that we have a similar platform like what you're doing for you know women who are in some stage of the journey some of them their husbands are way younger than mine they have you know children under age six who have husbands with this debilitating disease and so part of my um writing experience would be to explore those opportunities and creating a larger space of, of resources and support for us. And then the other aspect of it is more of a memoir because we have been surrounded by angels. We yes. have been surrounded. And even though this is very, very tough, it is. Um, I'd have to say that God has been with us from the minute all of this started. And really the doors have opened up. I mean, we actually received approval for his uh, social security disability before his diagnosis. Wow. Which I don't think that's- I That's don't unusual. Think, that's unusual. I don't think that that happens. But what I would say about that is do your research because I ended up, uh, learning that you can kind of bypass that waiting period if your first initial doctor's appointment is is five months before you apply. Well, then you've meted that criteria and you will immediately, once approved, get the back lump sum for that. I mean, okay. so there are things that you can do to prepare and things that I don't think are outlined for us anywhere. And so I would like to be able to uh, write about those things, but then also talk about the joys that come with, you know, living in the present as opposed to me thinking what's going to happen inevitably for my husband. I don't, that's not going to do me any good. It doesn't allow me to appreciate him even where he is. I right. need to appreciate him. So one bright spot that we had last week was he celebrated his 59th birthday, met his grandson, his firstborn grandson for the first time. And, you know, we captured the moment of him holding the baby and instinctively knowing how to cradle the back of his head and recognizing this young, innocent little being and loving on him. I mean, talk about ugly cry moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but it, you know, there've been a lot of, um, amidst all of the acceptance and the pain, there have been a lot of joy right. too. And so I just would like to pin that because, you know, that's our life. And I, I choose to remember the positive things also. I don't want it to just be a negative as we, you know, right. know what's in, what's in front of us, but there's no point in me um, clinging to that. I want to cling on to all that is good. So I hear you saying it's it's important that you want to to uh, cling on to the to the positive and that you want to live in the day and and yes. worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, I understand definitely, yes. definitely. Mm-hmm. So for someone, Doctor Anderson, that is going through this, whether they're so we here cater to dashers, those of us on the other side of our dash. But for anyone who is dealing with this, because it is a diagnosis that people uh, are known or that we know happens normally to older mm-hmm. people. But yes. as we know, everything, the whole landscape of the world, the, the health industry, everything, the way we live, you know, look, if you were a believer of Christ, you know what I'm talking about. Things that are coming to pass in fruition, you know, things are happen- happening to people sooner and sooner. So yes. to anyone, whether it be a male or female, young or old, what one piece of advice besides living in the day and accepting that day for that day would you give someone who is finding themselves facing this difficult challenge? I think it's important for us to um, create that circle of support, whether it's your immediate family or not. It doesn't have to be family. Um, doesn't have to be blood relatives. Family can be whoever your circle is, I really honestly believe that, that your circle um, can be comprised of, you know, immediate family members, long-term friends. Um, The example that I mentioned with the teammates that come, I've never met them. My husband and I have been together over 35 years. I didn't meet these men until last year. Wow. Uh, You know, we were uh, doing Zoom calls for him with his um, junior college, community college football teammates. And then we had his four-year teammates. They would all come together. And when we arrived uh, in Texas, um, two of them have just surrounded us. And one I had met like maybe five years ago once, but they are like brothers. And so when that connection's there and people offer their themselves to you, and are available to you, that's your circle. So surround yourself with your circle, Uh, seek the mental health specialist, your life coach, exercise. Um, I'm forcing myself to get out of my comfort zone to meet people. And so that's how we connect. Right. I mentioned that, that I wasn't quite sure how we did that, but it was through our group. Right. And I must have said, hey, (laughs) because, you know, that I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone. And so I think surrounding ourselves with those who are available to us and make themselves available is important. And that that's a first step. Okay. Okay, well, you know, Deborah, your story has been inspiring because not everyone's story necessarily looks the same, Mm -hmm. but you give hope. Um, And it was very important that you said to live in the day and think on the positive because there may be some bad days. We don't know what God has in store, but God said not to worry about what happens tomorrow. And I love that you said to just, 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 you know, think about what's happening today and think about the positive. And it's, it's very inspiring. I look forward, honestly, I look forward to uh, this book that you're going to get done hopefully in the next <laughs> year or so, you know, so we can do that. Um, did you have any last words before we go? Cause I, I don't think that you have a website or anything, but did you have any last words? Yes, I did want to mention, um, as I mentioned uh, before, I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone. And so since this is for after the dash, I think it's important to mention a few things. Um, I bought myself a pair of roller skates. 
and my intent leopard print roller skates by the way and so I intend to um, start roller skating again I used to live at the rink as a as a younger person and so I think it's important for those after the dash to to reconnect with things that you've always loved and so the other thing I want to mention to you is that if you haven't heard of the 40 plus double dutch group black women all over the nation are double dutching every week and they're all over the age of 40. Um, there are five sub clubs in the dallas area alone wow. and i think one of the oldest or most seniored uh, members of that group is 80 years old. Wow. And so I, I got my shirt. I've not connected with them yet, but I intend to do it. I've never double Dutch, but I would imagine the sisterhood and the friendship and everything is something that I need. Right. And so I wanted to mention that because um, we're uplifting each other. And that's really what I think this should be about is right. that, you know, empower each other, uplift each other, be supportive. And so um, I think that's what's been helping me. My circle, um, whether it stems from my childhood friends, even to my newest friends, has been very uplifting. And I just want to pay that forward. Okay. And mention okay. It. Well, as one of your newest friends, Deb, when this <laughs> when this new uh, Omarion virus is over, yes, <laughs> call me and I look. I haven't roller skated in ages. Look, me I got either. Arth I got arthritis, <laughs> but I will try to get out there with you. We have, look at least we'll laugh at me falling on my behind. But uh, yeah, call me. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. Yeah, I. I. You know, the other thing is. Um, and you might be able to help me with this. I am just navigate, learning to navigate around the area. And so I've not found a rink yet. And I have a little bit of fear about, you know, the huge tollways and everything. So we need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we, we can talk about that. But I'm going to tell you, uh, when I was here before, my family is actually from East Texas, but I was born and raised in Colorado. Mm -hmm. But honey, when I, <laughs> I, when I lived here, back in 2000 i moved in 2007. i lived in little m the little m frisco area yeah i came back i did not recognize a thing so <laughs> look we'll be navigating them together and just keep them okay. on with us because <laughs> but you know sounds you, good you, if you have any questions look i'm not a talker on the phone i'm just gonna tell you that shoot okay. me an email or whatever yeah. and i'll be happy to help you right but thank you it, you're welcome it's been so great <laughs> talking to you and i hope this is not the last time we talk um uh, on 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 camera on podcast off podcast whatever because you like I said you're very inspiring and I'm going to be praying for you and I know people say I'll pray for you and they don't mean it I mean it look matter of fact I'm in Thank my you. fast I'm in we're doing a 21 day fast so I mm -hmm. will add you to my prayer list and pray Thank for you, you so much I know you know you, you beautiful bright smiley face but I know <laughs> that you know sometimes it, it's hard and um I just encourage you to keep keep your head up and keep going the way you are and just keep God with you and you know what his will is his will and everything will work out according to his plan Deb. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you so much and you have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>